Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, I uh, would uh, wish to start, if that is okay. Short-lived climate pollutants is a very core issue that most of the time is forgotten. We are all here talking about climate change. We are all here looking at long-term issues. Short-lived climate pollutants are low-hanging fruits that can be able to be captured. Methane gas, that is one of them, you can also make money out of it. You can also utilize it. And I think that's the integral part we are talking about today. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the button of snooze is being pressed. The clock doesn't belong to us. But today, we have an opportunity to own the clock because we have very major people, global leaders, in front of us here who have turned around our countries in terms of climate change. And today, we are honored to be with them. But as a startup, I want to introduce a member of Stockholm Environment Institute, a reader at University of New York, who has been in say from 1989, I think I was still in high school, is a member of the Scientific Ad Advisory Panel and the Climate Clean Air Coalition. He has coordinated a UNEP WMO integrated assessment on black carbon, which is part of the uh, short, uh, uh, short uh, pollutants uh, that we are talking about today. We want to talk about benefits that he has done with the costs of mitigation and methane emissions. Please give it up for Dr. Johan, who is from SEI, to give us his opening remarks and set the scene. Please clap for him. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so your ex excellencies uh, from Ghana and Kenya and 
and representatives of the World Biogas Association, thank you very much for letting me um, give some opening remarks. So for about 10 years, there has been a, a, an increasing focus on these short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, I've been involved for about 15 years, um, and as was said just now, I helped to coordinate a, a, an, an assessment, a UNEP and WMO assessment on black carbon and tropospheric ozone. Um, and this o focus on ozone brought in methane, because methane is a precursor of the formation of tropospheric ozone. Anyway, this assessment came up with some really interesting insights about how we could reduce the rate of warming and achieve clean air benefits. Um, and this led to the formation of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition in 2012. And as has been said, I've, I've had the honor to sit on the scientific advisory panel since its inception. So Ghana was one of the first six countries that led to this or formed the CCAC, but there are now more than 70 countries and Kenya joined early on as well. So we at the Stockholm Environment Institute um, have supported work in Ghana and Kenya to uh, plan emission reductions um, and include these short-lived climate pollutants in planning, uh, mitigation planning. So let me introduce short-lived climate pollutants and why they are so interesting and important. So the short-lived climate pollutants encompass black carbon, methane, and hydrofluorocarbons. Methane and black carbon are part of both the climate and air quality issues, as I will explain soon. So the short-lived climate pollutants, as it says in the name, they warm the atmosphere and are short-lived. So if you implement measures um, to reduce the emission of these SLCPs, the concentration reduces quite quickly. So the warming influence they have reduces quickly as well. So you, you realize the climate better benefits from their reduction within one or two decades at the most. So this is really important in our fight to limit warming, uh, warming and try and keep it to 1.5 degrees C. Um, slowing the rate of warming and also avoiding um, air quality impacts. So reducing methane is critically important. It's probably the most single most important thing we can do to protect us from climate change in the near term, in the next 10, 20 years. So far, it's been responsible for about 30% of warming, and it has a lifetime of about 12 years in the atmosphere. So the, the CCAC, that's the Climate Clean Air Coalition and, and UNEP, produced last year a global methane assessment. And this identified existing cost-effective measures to reduce methane by about 45% by the year 2030 compared to what it would have been then. Now this would mean a reduction in the level of warming by the 2040s of 0.3 degrees C. Now that's quite a lot when you consider 1.5. And this is the level of methane mitigation, the sort of methane mitigation we need if we're going to be consistent with 1.5. So. Methane is essential for that, but to reach it, we have to do CO2 as well. Both have to be done. They're not alternatives. But this 45% has additional benefits because of the link to ozone and health. Ozone causes respiratory diseases like asthma and kills people prematurely. So this 45% reduction in methane would also lead to 250 or more than 250,000 deaths every year. It would lead to about... 750,000 fewer visits to hospital because of severe asthma attacks. But also, because of the change in the warming, you'd avoid 70 billion lost work hours due to avoided heat stress from people who have to work outdoors. If we look at black carbon, that's another SLCP, comes from incomplete combustion, and it's part of the story of PM 2.5. Now, six million people a year um, die uh, prematurely because of exposure to PM 2.5. Half of these due to indoor exposure. And um, there's a real need to, to address this issue which disproportionately affects women and children. So action on the black carbon and co-emitting substances would reduce health impacts, also reduce global warming, and reduce the disruption of local and regional air quality. So it doesn't make sense to address climate change and air pollution as separate issues. We need integrated assessments to develop coherent policy. 
So these local health and development benefits of action can drive policy, increase action on the cause of climate change. And as an example, just to finish off, as an example of this action on short-lived climate pollutants, we've had the signing of the Global Methane Pledge at this COP. 107 countries so far have now signed and committed to reduce their methane emissions by 30% globally by 2030. And philanthropies have pledged over 300 million US dollars to support, dollars to support countries to do this. So we need the action in the next years eight years on SLCPs to stay on track to achieve 1.5 and avoid a lot of the health impacts. Um, and um, I thank you for, for letting me open this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Johan, uh, for that uh, setting of the scene. And indeed, you have unveiled quite a lot of opportunities and challenges and uh, unpacked the whole agenda of today. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, um, I want to thank uh, both governments of Kenya and Ghana for uh, availing time and uh, uh, being available for this meeting. I want to thank Climate Works Foundation. I want to thank Joyful Women, Kenya Meteorological Society, and the World, Bas World Biogas Association for their partnership in this uh, meeting this evening. The ambassador of Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves and a person who supports Alliance and its partners to raise awareness of household air pollution, encourage broader adoption of clean cooking solutions in developing countries in a bid to create cleaner environments and eradicate deaths caused by pollution for the burning of solid fuel for cooking. She was honored in 2019 by the SE for All with conjunction with Ashton for efforts in towards issues of sustainable development goal SDG, 4, SDG 7, which ensures access to modern, reliable, renewable, and affordable by 2030. She's a founder and the CEO of Samira Empowerment and Humanitarian Projects a non-profit organization established to empower the underprivileged in Ghana through diverse social intervention projects to this agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you Her Excellency, the Second Lady of the Republic of Ghana, Her Excellency Samira Baumia, who is coming next to present to us her opening remarks. Please give it up for Her Excellency. Akwaba. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. This event marks an important step in addressing the issues of air pollution, climate change, and its synergies with women's health, gender inequality, and the economic empowerment of women across the African continent. I thank the Excell Her Excellency, Mrs. Rachel Rutu, and the Joyful Women Organization for inviting me. I'd want to also commend the organization for championing the cause of women empowerment in Kenya. Clean cooking solutions are a significant part of the clean energy transition and access conversation. Unfortunately, clean cooking hasn't been given the necessary attention and investment despite its enormous effects across the sustainable development agenda. Despite unclean cooking being a leading source of global air pollution and causing more deaths every year than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined, it's one of the most underfunded and furthest behind indicators in the SDGs, receiving less than 1% of the estimated resources needed to address it. Interventions to improve energy access have focused mainly on electricity access and have often ne neglected non-electricity household energy needs. While 1.3 billion people lack access to electricity, more than double that number, 3 billion, still rely on biomass for cooking. 
the number continues to rise. Close to 900 million of Africa's population lack clean cooking solutions. If these trends continue, it can be estimated that in, by 2030, Sub-Saharan Africa will have the greatest access deficit. Air pollution causes more than 7 million deaths every year, with 1.1 million deaths occurring in Africa. Household air pollution, which is driven largely by indoor cook stoves, accounted for 700,000 fatalities, uh, fatalities while indoor, while increased outdoor air pollution claimed 400,000 lives. Each number of these millions represents a mother, father, child, son, daughter, friend, etc. So these are deaths that matter, lives that matter as well. And they are avoidable. The state of global air study indicates that about 236,000 infants are estimated to have died of air pollution related causes in sub-Saharan Africa. Studies by a team of researchers led by Boston College and the UN Environment Program examining the toll of, on developing brains of children revealed that air pollution exposure to infants and young children resulted in the loss of 1.96 billion IQ points across the continent. These are not just mere numbers, but the loss of a future of a continent. This year, the UN Secretary General said, either we stop it, well, the choice is stuck. Either we stop it or it stops us. And at COP24, he reminded us of climate change is moving faster than we are. So we really are at a critical point. And we are far from our target of reaching all of the, our SDGs by 2030. SDG 7 calls for universal access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy by 2030. So there's so much more that we need to do, and we need to be at it now. It is therefore imperative that we remove the barriers that inhibit the scaling up and adoption of clean cooking solutions, such as access to clean cooking solutions, affordability of clean cooking solutions, cultural resistance to those solutions, that is designing technology that is adaptable and supported by the cultural preferences of each region, and subsidies that are also supported by governments and nations. We also need to look at what is sustainable in the long term, which is also very important for adoption. It's also important to in integrate clean cooking into government programs and policies and encourage the use of sustainable solutions and get concerted political will, which is lacking in most countries at the leadership level. The world is, has a huge challenge to move to net zero by 2050, and clean cooking is the, at the heart of it. Emission reductions have to go hand in hand with the efforts to ensure energy access by 2020 for all. The United Nations Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization estimates that the specific reductions of methane and carbon emitting activities could save 2.4 million lives by 2030 alone. So whilst we take measures to address the issue of air pollution, we need also to prioritize the issue of clean cooking as a major policy initiative. Let us continue this conversation while placing emphasis on the target regions in particular, that's especially in Africa and in Asia. Let us choose to strengthen synergies to achieve success for not just our present generation, but all generations to come. The future of Africa and the world depends on the actions we take now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those very, um, you know, uh, connecting issues about climate change to the grassroots. And I think you all know that more than 700 million people in Africa do not have electricity and are languishing also in issues of open fires in terms of cooking. So thank you very much, Your Excellency. I want to introduce to you the founder and the patron of MAMA organization. Through her leadership, she has become a role model for women and champion of faith diplomacy, indeed a prayer warrior for our country, Kenya. Food systems innovations, nutrition, mental health, wellness, inclusivity, climate change, entrepreneurship, and she is an avid cyclist 
who cycles almost every weekend and sometimes to go to work. This is something that uh, is not common in Africa. When you cycle, you are, you are deemed to be poor. And, uh, and, and this is a game changer. She founded the Joyful Women Organization, the first program of MAMA in 2009. It has grown to 110 women in 6,000 women groups in Kenya, revolving, listen to this, revolving over 20 million US dollar uh, in terms of uh, uh, its uh, capacity. Over the years, she has won various awards of excellence, notably State Commendation Award on the Elder of the Golden Heart, EGH. In 2015, 2014, she received an honorary fellowship award on the women empowerment and binary, at the Binary University of Malaysia. In 2021, she was appointed by the African Union Commission and the World Economic Forum as one of the high level champions on the AU decade of the women economic, economic power, empowerment and financial inclusion. I want to introduce to you the spouse of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, Her Excellency Mama Rachel Ruto. Please give it up for Mama Ruto. Karibu sana. Your Excellency Samira Bauma, Second Lady of the Republic of Ghana, our partners, the Climate and Clean Air Association, the United Nations Environmental Program, Climate Works Foundation, World Biogas Association, Kenya Climate Change Working Group, Kenya Meteorological Society, and UNFCCC, country representatives and delegates, all protocols observed. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this auspicious event. In light of the current climate emergency and the risk it poses to current and future generations, it is prudent that we shine a spotlight on the challenge of short-lived climate pollutants and their impact on women. As you may know, women bear the brunt of the accelerating impacts of climate change. Women in the everyday life are at the front line of multiple crises responsible for food systems, primary care, and most often responsible chores that place them at risk of such pollutants. Women in developing countries often bear the responsibility of cooking while providing care for their children. The most affordable cooking technologies are in their nature laden with short-lived climate pollutants. Constant exposure from use of fuels such as firewood and agricultural waste accounts for 90% of rural household energy needs. This results in serious health problems for women. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree that the use of these fuels in an enclosed environment with poor ventilation leads to high levels of smoke exposures, resulting in respiratory complications such as pneumonia and chronic obstructive lung disease. According to official statistics in Kenya, respiratory ailments, which are more prevalent in rural communities, account for 80% of non-communicable diseases. Depending on the level of exposure, women often die prematurely from these diseases. Exposure to short-lived climate pollutants on children have far-reaching consequences and inhibits them from reaching their full potential. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with such compelling evidence, you will agree that mitigating against the impact of short-lived climate pollutants is not only a shared value, but a shared responsibility. It is in this regard that Joyful Women and the Climate Works Foundation designed the SLCP project to better understand the impact of super pollutants on household health, air quality, and climate change at national and local level. While there was evidence at global scale on the impact of short-lived climate pollutants, there was hardly any quantifiable data and evidence at local level. The challenge of unavailability of data or data gaps that could be critical for policy and advocacy hindered policy and decision makers from better understanding and therefore designing policies that are relevant to this context. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, though the joyful women 
through the Joyful Women Network, comprising of over 100,000 women across Kenya, we were able to collect data on the levels of household pollutants caused by burning of solid fuels and levels of air pollution from vehicular emissions. This effort was unprecedented, exceeding current protocols of statistical sampling. I can confidently state that this has never been done before, creating an irrefutable body of evidence from women on the impacts of short-lived climate pollutants. We will all agree that it also affirms the power of women and their networks and what they can achieve in saving lives and livelihoods. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Preliminary findings from our two years of data collection and analysis confirms that the use of solid fuels in households in Kenya emits superpollutants into the atmosphere with black carbon dominating at 96.99%. We have also established that these pollutants cause multiple health challenges such as conjunctivitis, eye cataracts, pulmonary TB, uh, TB asthma, and allergies. The study further revealed that neither the women nor the health services providers associated the use of solid fuels with these health conditions. While the regulatory envir en environmental provides for the monitoring and control of air quality, it does not account for widespread use of solid fuels for domestic use and is blind to the gendered impact of short-lived climate pollutants. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, you will agree that women are more affected by household air pollution. The body of evidence generated from our research provides a compelling cause on the link between poverty and the inability of women to access clean cooking technologies and the need for policymakers to save women's and children's lives by providing for access to alternative cooking and lighting technologies. It is therefore my call to action for governments, private sector, civil society, and the United Nations to recognize that these diseases and deaths are preventable. We can also save lives and future generations by ensuring that women have access to affordable, cleaner sources of energy, and by so doing, reduce the risk on our, to our planet. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to join us in the pursuit for a cleaner and a healthier environment for women. With our collective voice and actions, we can reverse the impact of short-lived climate pollutants. Once again, I appreciate the grant we received from Climate Works Foundation that was instrumental in kickstarting the conversation on solid fuels and their impact on human health, air quality, and climate change. As we conclude the first stage of the Kenya SLCP project, let us scale up our partnership and move to the next stage of implementation. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Indeed, you all heard it's about health. It's about empowerment. And Joyful um, Organization is spreading, it's spreading in other countries. It's actually spreading like M-Pesa, for those who know about M-Pesa, because it's a concrete uh, organization that has uh, created the issues of money to the pocket. And I think that's what we're tackling about here. As we wait for that adaptation fund, as we wait for the monies that we are struggling here, I think there are homegrown solutions which are working in Kenya. And I thank you, Your Excellency uh, Rachel Ruto, for empowering our women in Kenya. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, we want to uh, switch gears and ask you if you can be seated on the other side as I call the colleagues who are in here. And please clap for them, please. They've done a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to call the next panelists. Please, uh, you know yourselves. Arnold. Mr. Arnold Tuway. Charlotte Morton. Alex Marshall. Please uh, uh, be on the stage. Uh, thank you very much. As we switch gears, we want to uh, dig deep uh, and uh, to dive, dive deep into the matters that we are discussing today. 
matters that are very critical to our health, matters that uh, also uh, avail opportunities like methane, and to see how this can be tackled. To help us unpack this, we have the founder and the executive director of Global South Climate Initiatives, which is an ungovernmental organization that works to support design of grassroots and locally led climate action, climate information and sharing communication. He currently serves as a project officer of the Kenya SLCP project. He is an avid environmentalist, passionate about building resilience and sustainable economies. Ladies and gentlemen, help me in inviting Mr. Arnold Tue Kipchumba on the floor. Karibu. So thank you so much, uh, Kioli, for that kind introduction. Um, so my name is Arnold Kipchumba, and I'll be going through the work that we've been doing with the Kenya SLCP project for the past two years. Um, so this is a project that has been funded by Climate Works Foundation um, with implementation with the Joyful Women Organization, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, Kenya Meteorological Society, and Council of Governor Secretary. So I'll just quickly go through the work that we've been doing and what we wanted to understand is the scale and status of short-lived climate pollutants and the effect it has on air quality, climate change, and women's health in Kenya. Um, so just a quick uh, background information about what you know, informed this work is one, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, special report on reducing short-lived climate pollutants says that we need to reduce emissions from methane and black carbon by 45% percent if you're able to achieve the climate goal of 1.5. Um, also, again, another statistic is that 70 percent of the Kenyan population is reliant on biomass use. And of this 70 percent, 90 percent is from rural households. So again, also another statistic from WHO, uh, 4 million people die prematurely um, with illnesses attributed to um, short-lived climate pollutants uh, and air pollution. Uh, and the Kenya uh, Ministry of Forestry and Environment um, says that 14,300 people uh, die annually from this related death. So you can see the synergies um, between um, exposure to, to these pollutants and the numbers of deaths that it's causing. So ideally what we were looking at is to, one, uh, quantify uh, short-lived climate pollutants, um, in particular black carbon, uh, emissions uh, and the effect it has on air quality, climate change, and health. Also to analyze the institution and legislative framework of short-lived climate pollutants in Kenya. So to just understand what is the legal environment around short-lived climate pollutants uh, in Kenya and if it's inculcated into the policy processes. Uh, number three also to just strengthen um, the capacity of subnational entities. Um, so Kenya has a devolved system of government, uh, and so we have 47 govern uh, county governments. And so we just wanted to strengthen the capacity of um, um, subnational entities and civil society organizations um, in managing short-lived climate pollutants. Also, uh, lastly, is to recommend strategies on how we were going to integrate aspects of short-lived climate pollutants into the revised um, Kenyan NDC that was submitted last year. Um, so this was covered partly by Johan, but uh, Johan in, in, uh, while setting the, the scene um, for this. But what are short-lived climate pollutants? Um, they are climate forces that are really powerful and have high potency level. So ideally what that means is then that they're able to um, retain so much heat um, compared to long-lived climate pollutants such as um, CO2. So we have black carbon, methane, uh, troposphoric ozone and HFCs. Methane, for example, has 86, 86 time potential to warm the climate than CO2. Um, and so, but in the case of this project, we are looking largely um, at black carbon emission at household level. Um, and as you can see, um, the effect is local uh, and black carbon emission stays um, in the atmosphere for a few days, yeah, for a few to two weeks. Um, but the level, its potency level is so high. So being able to reduce black carbon emissions from use of household 
um, of biomass use at the local level can be able to help countries, especially Kenya in this case, um, to achieve its near-term goals of 1.5. Um, so here is just the climate mitigation pathway, so scenarios that have been developed by Climate and Clean Air Coalition, just showing the different scenarios um, that exist if we continued business as usual, um, if we reduced, um, you know, we had actions on CO2. Um, so the curve just shows, um, so you see, if we continue as business as usual, we'll surpass, we'll go to the three degrees. Um, and if we have CO2 actions alone, still we are not meeting the target. Um, if we have black carbon and methane actions alone, um, we are still not meeting the target. It will be way above two degrees. Um, but we are, if we are able to now integrate action uh, of CO2 action and black carbon and methane action and HFCs action, um, it provides an opportunity for us um, to meet the Paris goal of 1.5. Um, so this just shows um, where we did sampling um, in Kenya, the counties, as I'd mentioned. And ideally, what we are trying to look at is one, um, the type of biomass majority of Kenyans are using, uh, two, also to quantify the potential, um, the global warming potential uh, of, of, of black carbon um, in these counties. Um, also, again, uh, what we've learned with this project is the role that civil society and subnational uh, entities play um, when it comes to reducing short-lived climate pollutants. They offer an opportunity to complement what the national governments are doing, um, and also they can raise ambition um, to what the national government is already doing. Also, civil society organizations in terms of, of, you know, um, um, acts as a bridge between academia and local people, able to translate um, scientific information into a language that people would, would be understand. So we've been working with Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, um, who've been mobilizing civil society organizations in Kenya to be able to incorporate aspects of short-lived climate pollutants into their projects. Um, and then also, uh, one of the recommendation, um, uh, one of the objective was to recommend strategies of um, to integrate uh, SLCPs into the NDC, and we are proud to say that we were actively involved in the review process of the NDC for Kenya, and we, for now, um, aspects of short-lived climate pollutants have been involved in the, have been incorporated in the revised Kenyan NDC, and also highlights of sustainable energy, and also inclusion of just transition, just what many will be done. So the potential core benefits that have been provided um, when you reduce short-lived climate pollutants. As other speakers have said, one of the main core benefits is health um, because many people are dying, uh, improved technology, increased um, energy security, uh, more rural employment. Um, so that's the work that we've been doing for the past um, one and a half years now. Um, and we'll be having a workshop next year in Nairobi around March um, to share the full report of the work that we've been doing. Thank you so much, uh, Kyolia Santa. Thank you very much, uh, Arnold. Um, is, it, is this one on? Yeah. My mic on? Uh, thank you very much, Arnold, for unpacking the short-term lived uh, um, climate pollutants. Indeed, it's a, it's a good thing that you've unpacked, and uh, now we can dwell with it more. You all know that in 2015, countries signed to Paris Agreement, and most of the countries, like my country, it became part of our constitution. One of the promises we made was the NDC, the Nationally Determined Contribution. As a country, Kenya, we promised to cut down 32%, which is equivalent to 143 million tons of carbon uh, emissions uh, equivalent. One of the key areas we are thinking of capturing that and meeting our obligation is by issues of methane capturing. Biogas presents a very good solution to that. And you capture it and you use it, meaning that is one of the opportunities that can make Africa realize energy access and equity in terms of it and becoming renewable and accessible. And this is the topic we are going to talk about next. She studied MBA at London Business School before setting up a car club business. And uh, she saw a potential in an industry that had 
huge potential and value in the UK, given the even bigger global potential which must be achieved if Paris Agreement, Paris climate change targets, and UN sustainability goals are to be met. She played a pivotal role in the establishment of the World Biogas Association in the 2016 to promote, increase the rate of uptake of biogas globally. Join me in inviting Madam Shalor Moton from World, Bas World Biogas Association, World w WBA. Welcome to the podium. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. The WBA is the, World Biog is, is the global trade association for the biogas, landfill gas, and anaerobic digestion sectors. Today, I'm here in Glasgow at COP26 to talk to all of you here present physically and to all of you participating virtually about methane. Methane, as you know, has been very much in the news a lot this year, not least following the launch of the Global Methane Initiative earlier at COP. John Kerry, the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, describes the impact of delivering on the pledge as extraordinary. The equivalent of making all trucks and lorries, cars, planes, and shipping net zero. Humans, directly or indirectly, generate over 105 billion tons of organic wastes globally each year, all of which release harmful methane emissions and other greenhouse gases directly into the atmosphere as they decompose. Organic waste from food production, food waste itself, farming, landfill, and wastewater treatment are responsible for about 25% of global methane emissions caused by human activity. However, today, only 2% of these are treated and recycled, which means that 98% are emitting methane. It is therefore critical that we usher in a new era of waste management. We haven't changed how we treat our waste for millennia. We either burn or bury it. That has to change. But changing how we look at waste, in fact, presents a huge opportunity. Not only do we stop those methane emissions, but we can recover the valuable resources that those wastes contain. Anaerobic digestion recycles these wastes into green energy in the form of biogas for electricity or biomethane for heat and transport. In fact, enough to replace over a quarter of today's global coal consumption. A natural fertilizer to restore our depleted soils, bio CO2 and other valuable bioproducts. By treating through anaerobic digestion all of the 105 billion tons of organic waste produced by humanity ourselves every year, biogas can reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 10% by, 10, by 2030. While we were all grappling with the raging pandemic, in 2020, there was a record-breaking rise in global methane emissions. Following Johan's remarks, I don't need to repeat why that is worrying. Over 100 countries have already signed up to the Global Methane Pledge here at COP to deliver a 30% cut in man-made methane emissions by 2030. But while the Methane Pledge is a great step in the right direction, those targets cannot be met without the right level of investment and policies in place to support the technologies that will deliver those methane reductions. UNEP has recognized biogas as one of the readily available technologies that can deliver methane emissions reduction at low cost, especially in the waste sector. 
In fact, AD can deliver around 50% of the global methane pledge target. AD offers a circular solution that acts as a catalyst for circular economies across multiple sectors. When waste becomes a resource, you start, in fact, to see very little waste. As, could, as can be seen here, there are immediate direct benefits in delivering on the Paris Agreement and Global Methane Pledge. There are additional positive externalities too, such as improved energy security and the arresting of soil degradation through the return of much needed carbon into the soil. The UNFCCC, the guardians of the Paris Agreement, call biogas a win, 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 win solution. In this slide, hopefully you can clearly see the dividends of anaerobic digestion or biogas. Something that I haven't yet mentioned is that by recycling methane emitting waste into bioresources, we can create millions of jobs globally too. We estimate 11 to 15 million jobs globally. And given that we have been sharing a platform with Her, Excellence, Her Excellency Samira Bawumia, Ambassador for the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, it's important to emphasize point five. Biogas is a solution for clean cooking. Using biogas for cooking reduces the use of biomass, which in turn reduces the emissions of black carbon. To conclude, there is only one direction of travel. Biogas can deliver the Global Methane Pledge from farm to fork and back again. It can improve the quality of life for people in the remotest villages in the world. It can mark the end of waste and deliver systemic change. It stands at the heart of the circular economy, says the International Energy Agency. It is tomorrow's technology here today. You can find out more here through our website. In the meantime, I'm delighted, or perhaps through you, John, to introduce Alex Marshall from Clark Energy. But John, I will let you yeah. do that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was Charlotte Morton from the CEO of uh, World Biogas Association. Now, we are going to switch gears uh, extremely fast. There's a small clock here. It will be like three minutes each, and I won't do uh, the normal uh, introduction. So I want to invite Alex Marshall, the director of Clark Energy, to take the floor. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> do, do we have the slides? Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Clark Energy is um, uh, coming at this from a commercial basis. Uh, Clark Energy, we, we operate in 28 countries across the world. We have globally 7.2 gigawatts of power generation installed, which is roughly 18 million homes. We're, we're a localized business, which uh, is important because biogas has the opportunity to give local sources of uh, jobs and employment in looking after biogas plants and the associated machinery. This is an important factor. Um, we help also support businesses generate renewable supplies, um, reliable supplies of power. This is particularly important from an African perspective where the, the wider electricity grid is, is often unreliable. So that uh, resilience is, is another important part of sustainability. Globally, we've got 1.3 gigawatts of renewable energy. Most of this comes from the waste treatment industry. And when we're talking waste to energy, we're not talking uh, incineration, we're talking biogas, uh, and energy from wastewater treatment plants, uh, energy from uh, distilleries, etc., for organic wastes that would otherwise have been wasted. Um, our business seeks to reduce uh, methane and carbon dioxide emissions through increasing efficiency of power generation uh, and also capturing uh, methane, this is important to this subject. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned before is, is biogas and methane and renewable methane is a 
storable form of power, hence it can time shift when energy is required. With moving to more and more wind and solar power, the problem here is demand and supply do not match. The wind blows when the wind blows, the sun shines when the sun shines, and that doesn't match when we put on our kettle in the morning and want a cup of tea. So if we look at biogas um, and, and its different applications, or methane, its different applications in, in a gas engine, so our, our experience is gas engines and biogas upgrading facilities, there are a range of different uses of that. So if we go around on, on the top and the right-hand side, uh, there's forms of um, ways you capture methane emissions using biogas. So firstly, biogas from waste, whether that's um, discarded food waste that would rot, rot down organically. It can either rot down uh, aerobically, which is like composting, or anaerobically, which generates methane, which should be captured. Um, biogas from agriculture, if those waste materials are able to uh, generate uh, um, methane, then that's a source, of, uh, source that can be captured. Wastewater treatment plants from sewage gas and landfill sites. Likewise, uh, the fossil industry still also emits methane to atmosphere. So at fossil fuel extraction sites, uh, at, at oil wells, and at coal mines, they also have methane sources that can be captured and utilized. This is a particular example of the, the installed base we have globally, but not necessarily look at where we have installed the most. Look at where globally there is least um, utilization of biogas. I mean, particularly from an Indian perspective, whilst they're one of the pioneers of using biogas, there's huge opportunities there to recover and utilize municipal waste um, and, and at wastewater treatment plants. And, and likewise, Africa does have examples, I mean, a growing number of examples of, of utilizing biogas, but still, particularly in the industrial sectors like Lagos, uh, sorry, the, 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 the um, built-up sectors like Lagos, uh, Johannesburg, uh, and other major cities, the waste treatment infrastructure could certainly be improved. So globally, I've estimated our installed fleet is, is able to uh, um, re reduce roughly 17 to 20 million tons of, of carbon dioxide emission, sorry, CH4 emission avoidance. So if we look at some project examples, first it would be remiss not to talk about Kenya. It, tropical power in the Lake Nyavasha is, is a waste treatment site that utilizes um, flower farm wastes and uses it for power generation. That particular site, roughly 650 normal meters cubed per hour of methane is used there. Agrigaz in France, this is a site that re um, recovers biogas, upgrades it to biomethane and injects it into the, into the local gas grid, a renewable source of power. Kadungayo in uh, Chennai, 15 years of operation generating one megawatt of power, roughly 650 normal meters cubed per hour of, of methane which is being recovered, prevented from em emission to atmosphere and utilized for power. I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm <laughs> one, one last one very quickly. The Plessy Gasso is another interesting one captures um, methane from a landfill site, but not only generates electricity, also renewable heat as well for the local village. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry for being a, a bit rude, but uh, 5.15, we have to be out of this room. So believe me, uh, we'll be out of this room. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want us to switch gears once more to invite uh, 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 a few panelists here to join me. I uh, want to invite Ruth Sego, who is a senior program association associate with Climate Works Foundation. I want to invite uh, Dr. Ted Moyo, who is an Oxford fellow. I want to invite um, 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 Shalom is already there, and Marshall. Please, uh, Dr. Moyo, and uh, yeah, please, uh, please give them a round of applause, please, as they come. Thank you very much. Very good. I think this has been a very interesting topic, and uh, it's, it's really on the ground. Sometimes when you see these big names, uh, but when you unpack them, they really become quite uh, uh, handy, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, the panelists took the point home. So I want to ask uh, Ted Moyo, Moya uh, to start with you. Um, if you could tell us what policy and research barriers exist in southern, uh, south, uh, sub, sub, sub Saharan, sub Saharan Africa, that contribute to increased SLCPs in the environment. Um, thank you very much indeed. I think there are three main challenges. The first one would be actors, the second would be finance, and the third would be technology. 
on actors at international level, the legal and regulatory regime is fragmented. We do not have a specific instrument or instruments that specifically cover SLCPs. So that's the first thing at international level. And therefore, at national level as well, we also lack the same thing. But the most important thing is we're looking at impact. So at local level, there is lacking local action. So we need three things on that first point. We need international cooperation, and I'm glad to see all the panelists here and all the actors who are there. We need national coordination, but we need local action. So on the second one, we need to deploy funds in the right place. And on the third one, we need technologies deployed um, to ensure that we cover this. So those are the barriers that I think. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ted. That was very point home. Uh, Ruth, I want to come to you. Ruth, you are leading a very big organization, Climate Works Foundation. What locally led interventions could developing countries take into consideration in addressing SLCPs and the role of philanthropists like Climate Works Foundation? Um, great, thank you for that excellent question. So I would start by saying that we see this very much as the missing piece in the global energy transition narrative. So we haven't unpacked or focused enough on you know, the missing voices of women in the global south and their access to energy. So I'll just start by saying that that is the motivation for this project. Um, and then in terms of things that developing countries ought to do, um, I think that what we are seeing from this project is that there are massive data gaps, there are massive governance challenges um, as regards addressing super pollutants. So I would say that um, what the SLCP project is doing is focusing mostly on that, right? So raising awareness first on the importance of super pollutants and then thinking about how this translates into policy formulation processes. So I think that that is one of the, you know, first steps that developing countries can, um, you know, take to address super pollutants. And then, of course, thinking more about the larger energy transition narratives. Um, you know, there, there are opportunities, as we've seen from uh, your presentation, to think about um, revolutionizing the energy grid in Africa, the opportunities for that. So I think that there's quite a lot that can be done. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Still with you, Ruth. Yes. I know you're working with women a lot. Could you say something about how this links to the women and youth? Well, I, I don't think I need to add anything to um, High Excellency Rachel Ruto's. I think she did put that very well, that there are serious issues here. And um, so I would just, for instance, give a, a very short um, personal story. So um, I come from Kenya originally, um, work with Climate Works in San Francisco. Um, and um, just from you know, my experiences in Kenya, right? what um, Mrs. Ruto said is quite true, right? That women are often bearing this uh, disproportionate burden of taking care of their communities, of their households, and often, um, you know, are at the front lines of, you know, pollution related to super pollutants. So I think that, um, you know, that is pretty much, I would say, a very inequitable position to be. Um, and seeing this project um, in many ways tries to address or unpack the inequity issues um, involved. Excellent, thank you. Point home. Charlotte, um, um, uh, you have explained quite a lot. I uh, was reading about the World uh, Biogas Association's Global Potential Report, and it says that uh, under the right enabling policies, treat all the readably available human-produced organic waste by 2030. Is this feasible? It's very much feasible from a practical point of view. Uh, so our members uh, were consulted on that before we made that commitment uh, in the form of a declaration to the UNFCCC. What we need uh, to ensure that it is practically deliverable are the policies on the ground and the, and the local support at, a, at a, politi a political level to ensure that um, we can deliver it practically on the ground. So there's a lot of work to be done, and, uh, both in terms of getting recognition and the political will to make it happen. But yes, practically, it's doable. Thank you. That was the CEO of World Biogas Association. Thank you very much. Dr. Alex Marshall, um, what are the biggest barriers to wider deployment of biogas, CHP, and upgrading systems? Which countries have the greatest potential for biogas-fueled power? Yeah, so I think I echo some of the previous points here. Um, the most important thing is to ensure that there is the framework locally to deploy the waste treatment technologies. So firstly, having the correct legislation in place, not only having the correct legislation in place for waste treatments, having it enforced 
because it's pointless if it just sits there on a book and people don't do it in practice. Then having the ability to utilize the energy generated, the value of the energy, so selling that electricity to the grid. A big problem in Africa is the ability to actually sell power to the grid in a bankable format. So you find that they're typically used for captive power installations, which means there's less deployment than you would have expected otherwise. And by way of areas where it can be deployed more successfully, you know, countries like India with massive populations that have a history of biogas yet have not deployed it properly on landfill sites on, for the treatment of municipal waste. Uh, these are huge volume areas. And then the growing population in Africa needs to not be left behind and to have the affordability of those types of um, waste treatment uh, made available to everybody. Thank you. Maybe you could touch a little bit of, about packaging of biogas because it's still a challenge today in Kenya. Uh, when we package, it's still not very practical. Are there technologies which are mature now to package biogas in terms of if you want to take it from point A to point B? Yeah, yeah. certainly. So, so with the, the compression of gas has been done a lot, and particularly we found it was actually being pioneered in Africa. So our first references were on natural gas, but looking at compressed natural gas for utilization in Nigeria, and also liquefied natural gas or liquefied biomethane. This is quite mature technology. Uh, it can be done, but it does have a cost associated with it. Oh, thank you very much. I think methane gas is very interesting. We could talk and talk about even the byproducts, the slurry and all that, if we had more time. Please clap for these very important panelists. They did a good job, isn't it? And uh, before they leave, we could have one or two questions, if that is OK. I don't know how you do it. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm the boss now, so I'll choose <laughs> one from there. Yeah, one from there. And uh, in the middle, do you have any questions? Oh, everything was understood. This side? All right. So you guys did a good job. Could uh, that person have the mic, please? Please say your name and uh, maybe your country. We need to leave like five minutes for photos here, if you wish. So. We need to make it <laughs> as fast as possible. Then, yeah. He said, don't be there. He was just walking through the auditorium. Say it again. He didn't go into the mic. He was just walking through the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> OK, please. There's no question? There's a question. Yeah, so my name is Evans Lagat, uh, a lawyer from Kenya. Um, so a question, I don't know any of the panelists can take it up. Um, I think the enduring thing that I hear also, uh, up there is that uh, something about policy and legislative framework. Now, I, from my experience, I think uh, beyond the policy and leg uh, regulatory framework, there must be something else that, um, say for instance, something like black carbon. Um, it is supposed to be um, implemented or um, the policies are supposed to be implemented by the subnational government. And I think, for me, it is the finance that is perhaps an issue, and capacity. So I don't know how that can be addressed. Any can uh, respond to that. Alex, you want to? Oh, fr fr from a finance perspective, a biogas plant or a waste treatment facility is funded by two things. Firstly is the gate fee, the amount of money treat for per every ton of waste that comes through the, through, through the door. That is typically financed by local taxes. So if the local people can't afford the correct level of tax to pay for, for the waste treatment, that's a problem. And the other mechanism of, of, of revenue for these facilities is the sale of electricity. So the sale of electricity, therefore, needs to be bankable and at a level which makes the, the project stack up. So if these factors don't uh, add up financially, then you have a problem. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You want to add something, Shalom? Well, I would just add that one of the problems about... Um, addressing climate change in particular. One of the problems about addressing climate change in particular is for these solutions is that we don't put a price on the benefits that the technologies deliver. So we've just talked about how much methane capturing all the organic waste uh, that we are generating and putting them through AD, uh, the benefit of that is huge. But nobody is paying a reward for that. Yeah. So if there is a, a, a way to create a, a methane credit or something like that, then the economics of a biogas plant would be completely different. Excellent. Thank you. We have one last question here. 
Hello, thank you very much. My name is Marielle. I work with Gaia, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, and we support zero waste strategies in cities and communities all over the world. Um, we support definitely many of the projects that have been presented uh, in your event. Uh, what we find for this to be successful is that one key piece on the puzzle is to make sure that organic waste is separated at the source. So we see here a connection with waste management policies that very often miss that step, just jump into implementing some of these projects without having sorted this uh, important element, which is separating the organic waste at the source. And therefore, we missed a really important uh, opportunity to make sure that these projects are successful and can be uh, implemented at scale. So I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit on your thoughts, if you see the same, if you think that, yeah, about this, this, this important element, which is the, the, the waste management policies to be aligned uh, with the, to make sure that these projects can happen. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly. Any of the panelists? Charlotte, you can go. I can take it very briefly. You're completely right uh, that it is vital that we, particularly in the case of food waste uh, and, and agri-waste, that these are separated uh, at source. And there's an additional benefit to doing that, which is that uh, you see a food waste reduction, which delivers a further significant benefit. So just by recycling organic wastes through anaerobic digestion will get you a 10% reduction in global emissions. You can get a, a further 3% reduction in global emissions by, through the food waste reduction you get that is delivered by separate food waste collections. So yes, it's absolutely really important. There is a cost attached to it, but we see the benefits. So we have to find the solution to paying for what needs to happen. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say it was a nice day. We did a good job. Please clap for yourself also. Uh, we've come to the end of uh, our session. Uh, I don't know how protocols allows, but there was a request by the panelists to take a photo with your excellencies. Uh, is, I don't know. Sorry. Forgive me if uh, the protocols are not. Yeah. Okay. I can see a thumbs up. The panelists, please come. Uh, I'll just clear these glasses off.